open. Um, so I've been asked to talk about the challenges and successes of cultural boycott in the UK. Um, both challenges and successes are evident in the work of Artists of Palestine UK, we call ourselves APOC, which was founded in 2015 as a collective of artists and activists who came together to contest Israel's denial of cultural expression to Palestinians and its simultaneous shameless exploitation of culture to promote its diplomatic and political goals. So basically, um, APUC is a group which in its work, it spans all art forms. So for example, in November, we held a film-based event with discussions at an East London Art Gallery. And this was to commemorate the centenary of the Bible Declaration, which Shamir's always already talked about. I don't need to give you the background there. Um, on a different note, we have campaigned against the involvement of military-linked Israeli corporates in the art scene. And on a totally different note again, we have worked with Palestinian and US partners to expose the preposterous swag bag affair at the 2016 Hollywood Oscars. Let's see if I can... Oh, 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 okay, that's fine. So this was one of the wonderful memes that was produced by this uh, transatlantic partnership uh, in, in acting. I don't even remember the story. I think it's worth a brief detour uh, to talk about how we managed to bring together a host of big names to denounce the inclusion of a £55,000 VIP trip to Israel in a goodie bag of gifts offered to Oscar nominees. They were also offered other random items like a, a vampire breast lift, whatever that is, a lifetime supply of Yizora skin cream, and a sex toy, but only for female nominees, not for the guys. Uh, um, Brian Eno, a musician and composer who many of you would have heard of, suggested an alternative swag bag offering, and he had a whole list of, of ideas, and one of them was, visit Palestine, enjoy a tear gas filled weekend in an East Jerusalem ghetto, that sort of thing. So that was, that was one, a very successful campaign, which had massive media coverage, and in fact, we never heard of any Hollywood star taking advantage of Israel's PR offer. Um, sadly, it was the brutality of Israel's war on Gaza two years earlier, in 2014, that attracted support for APUC's first successful public initiative, which was the Artists' Pledge for Palestine. Um, I don't know if you want to take a minute to read what it says, but it's about supporting the Palestinian struggle for freedom, justice, and equality. It's a response to the PACB call that Shamu explained to us so well. Um, and, so we are. Uh, and it's basically, as uh, again Samir said, and I think uh, Chris said, it's about something that people can actively decide not to do in order to support principles of human rights and international law. We will actively not participate in the, the cultural whitewashing of the state of Israel. So what we found is, um, as Samir again said, when we launched the pledge in February 2015, it had just over 600 signatories. Now it has close to 1,300. And what that reflects, I think, is that people's attitude to boycott is becoming a bit more nuanced in the arts, not in society at large, I fear, but, but in the arts. Despite the hysteria in the UK about anti-Semitism, which is dangerously drawing attention away from the real rise of racism in general, especially anti-Muslim racism, this issue, cultural boycott issue, isn't see, being seen so much through the lens of anti-Semitism as other Palestine campaign issues are, and I think that's largely because we try very hard to keep the reality of the Palestinian presence, the Palestinian experience, at centre stage. So when people say, why are you boycotting, we say, well, look what Palestinians' lives are like, and we show them. And it's not just, you know, uh, us being, um, waging some sort of anti-Israeli campaign for no reason. Obviously, it's tempting to dwell on successes, but I've not been asked to talk about challenges, so I will. And a key challenge, again, it was touched on in some detail by Samir, it's the perception of what cultural boycott is and what it isn't. So one important feature, which perhaps we haven't quite mentioned yet, is that cultural boycott is not a boycott of culture. 
And often it's portrayed as if it were, and it suits our adversaries to, to, to portray it that way. Um, it's not a boycott of Israeli cultural workers. It's not a boycott of uh, Jewish cultural workers or performers because they come from Israel or are Jewish. Um, there's this accusation made that what we should be doing is building bridges, we should be, show, we should be launching dialogue. They come out with phrases such as culture, not conflict, bridges, not boycott. It's very clever and, and it's persuasive to many people. So, um, and that's probably one of the reasons why performances in Israel by starry figures from the global music business continue. It's also helped by the fact that Israeli promoters pay big money for what writer Fahana Sheikh, a member of the APUC collective, has called musical endorsements of repression. And you know, you know about some of these. Radiohead is a, a big case in point. They played Hayokan Park in Tel Aviv recently, constructed on the ruins of the Palestinian village of Jerisha. Um, a particular favourite of mine, it was terribly disappointing to me that the West African musician Baba Mal, who I think is fantastic, performed last year at the Tower of David, a renamed Ottoman building, which has become the symbol of Israel's intention to remake multinational Jerusalem as a Jewish city. And we confronted Baba Mal about this, we talked to him about it, and he seems to be honestly persuaded of the persuasiveness of his music that he, that the idea of art transcending politics, that he will go and he will play and people will hear and people will love him and people will just stop conf stop having a conflict and live happily ever after. It's terribly naive. But I think it's, you know, a brilliant artist can have this misconception and he's far from being the only one. Um, as Shemit Samir also mentioned, Israel celebrates each breach of boycott and each endorsement of its immunity, sometimes with quite nauseating propaganda. One example, um, oh, that's it, okay, is the, uh, the British band Alt-J, which was exalted with praise by a writer in the Times of Israel for lifting the spirits of the nation's young soldiers, past soldiers, present soldiers, and future soldiers. It was really, it was quite extraordinary. We, we wrote a, an artist's prose line at the time, this guy, um, David Horowitz, yeah. Um, his purple prose exalts the audience who flock to the concert. Young Israel, army kids, post-army kids, and tomorrow's army kids. It was nauseating, it really was. I did embed some live links in here, but it would take too long and it didn't really work earlier, so I won't bother, but I, if you want to read something that'll really make you puke, have a look at the, <laughs> have a look at the original story there. Um, so, some artists go, some artists go but regret it. And an example of that is um, soul singer Marcy Gray in 2011. She actually generated a massive debate on her own Facebook page by asking her fans, should I be going? You know, I've got this concert plan, what should I do? And there was a big argument and all the usual um, contested ideas flew back and forth. She did decide to go uh, in January 2011, but in, just in November she said on Twitter, I had a reality check and I stated that I definitely would not have played there if I had known even the little that I know now. That may sound contradictory because she had asked for opinions in advance, so she knew something. But I think um, her experience, it, it reflects what we're often told, that if people go there, it just changes their whole mindset. So I think you can hear the arguments, you can have it explained to you intellectually, you can even watch stuff on video or YouTube or whatever, but to actually go there and experience it can be transformative. So obviously artists need help and support to understand the justification for and the importance of the boycott. APOC's founding and launch of the pledge coincided with publication of the booklet dealing with all the intricacies. No? Again? Oh, no, come on, come back. <laughs> Why do I do any clues up there, Renza? Mm -hmm. Sorry, it's gone blank. What have I done? Mm -hmm. Something. <laughs> I'll try another knob. No, not that one. It's pretty. It, basically, all I was going to show you there was the um, what, what the booklet looks like. Um, actually, Chris was referring to that's it. Yeah, Chris was referring referring to the to this booklet when he mentioned the Pat B guidelines. 
The guidelines are in there in full, but that's separate, but you, you would find where to look for the guidelines in there. And it's wonderful, this has now been translated into Dutch, thanks to the efforts of our friends from DOCP. I hope it will prove as useful here as it have, has been in the UK. I'm um, happy to say I can continue with a few more successes. Basically, it, not specific things, but a broadening and deepening of the support for Palestine among artists and cultural workers. There is an increasing understanding that art does not transcend politics. I think people see more clearly as a result of this work that art can be used for good or ill by oppressors and by oppressed, and it's almost never truly <coughs> neutral. We, we are finding that we are setting limits to Israel's attempts to establish a lasting, normalised cultural presence. There was a time when theatre and dance companies promoted by the state were regular visitors to Britain, and their, their visit sparked protests, extensive protests, which helped to give the impetus to the formation of Artists for Palestine. I'll just mention a couple. Uh, back in 2011, the Israel Philharmonic came to the UK and did a concert as part of the Royal Promenade concerts, which are the proms, really famous, broadcast all over the world, and protests on that occasion actually halted the broadcast of the concerts for the first time ever. It was always broadcast um, by the BBC in the 75 year history of the Promenade concerts. Bathsheba Dance, an interesting case because the artistic director of Had Maharin is actually a figure on the Israeli left, which I might want to to comment on what is this Israeli left. And he, you know, he opposes the occupation, he gives money to good causes, but he couldn't see that his company, he and his company were being used as cultural ambassadors, whether he liked it or not, and he would not dissociate himself from that because he didn't accept that it was happening. So there were protests and, and disruptions of those performances. Habima uh, National Theatre was another such case where we gained huge support for a campaign against their presence because they were quite actively performing in settlements and putting pressure on actors within the company who didn't want to. So they were, um, they were a target. Now we find that state-promoted tours seem to be a lot rarer, and there's more emphasis on outright Hasbara, things called Shalom festivals. You know, there was one in Edinburgh. I'm very good at this. Oh, ah, there we go. Um, the Edinburgh Festival in, uh, in Scotland is an amazing cultural event that happens every year, goes on for weeks and weeks. And two years in a row, the Israelis have put on what they call um, International Shalom Festival. They're basically very poor, rather pathetic, culturally, um, attempts to, to present Israel as a multicultural um, example of coexistence and so on. And it's, it just attracts protest, and it's very, very blatant. Um, they did it this, this year they did it in London as well, and they chose the, the Roundhouse, which is a sort of radical venue, very well respected. Um, we called it an occupation, and many, many people with big names, Roger Waters, Ken Loach, etc., etc., um, joined us in calling for the venue not to host this event, which was blatant Hasbara, because it was revealed by the director of the event itself, it's called TLV and LDM, meant to be very clever, Tel Aviv in London. Um, it was actually a dream child of the diplomatic mission in the UK that they should put this thing on. And afterwards, the management at the Roundhouse, speaking privately to campaigners, agreed that they should not agree to, have, to host this. So more broadly, protests and open letters that we've organised have been widely covered in European and American media. And this has changed the climate of debate. So if Fatboy Slim or the Chemical Brothers or other well-known names refuse to engage with critics and fly off to Tel Aviv, the controversy surrounding such actions becomes very strong. And debate in arts media shows that culture and creativity can be the guise worn by power and oppression. Most recently, as Samir mentioned, we've had extensive coverage, coverage of singer Nick's Cave, Nick Cave's insistence on defying the boycott, and he left absolutely no doubt that he was on the side of the oppressor. Statements from Pac B, from the Israeli group Boycott from Within, and especially from APUC have been quoted and or linked to. But uh, again, as Samir mentioned, Cave was hailed by Israeli embassies and lobbyists worldwide. This is what, this is an example of what he said 
And there's a tweet from the Consulate General of Israel in New York. Thank you, Nick Cave, for standing with Israel and against the dark forces of BDS. <laughs> and if my live link was working, I could show you a whole list of these because, as somebody has pointed out, APOC have, have compiled all these, these uh, Hasbara um, references to Nick Cave and others who, who take the side of the oppressor. So music media now routinely for, refer to boycott as a legitimate response from artists to Israel's oppression of the Palestinian people. The New Musical Express, in articles about Nick Cave, refer back to the earlier campaign around Radiohead, where lead singer Tom York had argued on Twitter with boycott advocate Ken Loach, Britain's great radical filmmaker. Um, yes, there we go. Um, <coughs> and the New Musical Express featured an interview with a BDS activist, it's uh, linked to in that story, at the Glastonbury Festival, as if it was the most normal thing in the world. So you click on New Musical Express reporting Glastonbury, and there's a nice little video, one of their journalists talking to a well-known boycott activist, just, well, here we go, there's an interesting discussion going on here. And the message was really very uh, succinctly expressed on that occasion. Performers such as Cave and York have a huge global following, so such campaigns massively extend awareness of how Israel's war <coughs> impacts Palestinian cultural life. It spreads understanding of how culture works as diplomacy or positive image making for Israel. But we have yet more, more challenges. As I said earlier, uh, boycott is effective when it places the Palestinian struggle for justice center stage. And this is where we have many challenges. APOC tries to illuminate everyday struggles in Israel-Palestine, including the blatant instrumental use of culture by the Israeli state. Just two examples, theatre companies these days are given incentives to perform in the occupied territories. Absolutely scandalous. Film funding is increasingly tied to political orthodoxy. So a filmmaker who departs from the accepted narrative is likely to find that their, their funding is endangered. Um, APOC has a, a section called Arts Watch. I haven't bothered to put anything up here, but it tracks these developments. And you can see how individual decisions about this film company here, that theatre the performer there, these sort of individual decisions harden into a system in which culture and occupation are tightly bound together. The Israeli state seeking to fra fragment and repress the culture of power. Palestinians, even criminalising social media activity. You may have heard of um, Darlene Tatour, who has been prosecuted for poetry she wrote on Facebook. She was one of 150 Palestinians, oh God, there she is, 150 Palestinians arrested between October 2015 and February 2016 alone, because their Facebook posts displeased the Israeli censors. She's still under house arrest and subject to periodic court appearances. Um, I suppose on the plus side, social media does give solidarity organisations the means to make cases like hers much more visible. And APOC's been part of an international campaign in her defence, uh, including this was at the Edinburgh Festival in 2016, where this leaflet was distributed and we had various actions around her. So repression occurs through a low-level war of attrition, which is quite deliberate and conscious. Israel's culture minister, Miri Regev, talks openly about, quote, silencing the Palestinian narrative, close quote. So we have to build on past successes and we have to meet the challenges. We have to show how silencing works while establishing the question of Palestine as something important to the debates and to the practice of artists in Britain, and I would say here as well, of course. So Artists for Palestine emphasis, emphasizes the importance of quiet, behind-the-scenes diplomacy with artists. You have to genuinely give them a chance to engage with Palestinians and their supporters before making our campaigns public. Because once you go public, it's very difficult for them to back out of plans that they've made to break the boycott. So we're not bullies, and we do welcome real dialogue. But once it gets beyond the, the point of no return, as with Kelly from Radiohead, then blast it out and it goes all over the media. Many artists won't go to Israel on principle which is great, but they don't want to be seen publicly lecturing their peers. So there are many people who you know are on the right side, but you can't pull them into the campaign. And that's disappointing, it's a challenge. Some people who are 
on side in terms of defending Palestine and justice for Palestine, are worried about compromising personal and professional relationships. So they won't go themselves, but they're very uneasy about publicly making their voices heard. Uh, some think that people should be left to make up their own minds, to go if they want, a bit like Macy Gray, maybe to visit Hebron and elsewhere in the OPT, uh, Occupied Territories, and be radicalised by that experience. So it's a challenge to keep artists who are thinking this way engaged and working together for a free Palestine. The movement needs diversity and the plurality of voices. It needs to be intersectional, that's already been touched on, very important. Connecting Palestine with other indigenous struggles and other decolonizing movements. Many brave and outspoken artists are established white males. Ken Loach and Roger Waters are key examples. They make waves when they speak, but they don't reflect the diversity of support that there is in BDS. They know this, they particularly Ken will say, please don't put me up there again, you know, people are going to get involved with me. They acknowledge that the movement needs new voices, new tactics, new arguments. We have to show that we're not dogmatic and predictable. Endlessly leafleting and protesting outside venues risks making the public think we are against culture, as discussed earlier. We know about fossil fuel campaigners who have been leafleting and, and protesting outside a particular art gallery in London, and then they switched to guerrilla artistic interventions inside the museums. They were enjoyable spectacles which caught the management and the public off guard. People weren't sure, is this art, is this protest, oh, this is interesting. It was a new way of approaching protest. So we already have skillful activists, artists, I love this term, artivists, who've been producing clever, entertaining work like this street poster which was used, not that one, oh, there, that's it, it's Nick Cave again, but isn't that clever? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so lots of things like that really make you think. There have been some wonderful musical parodies, there was one recently where you see a, a Radiohead con concert, and if you listen carefully to the words which are being sung, they're like Sue's wonderful parodies, they're not saying what the artist originally intended, that's good stuff. So let me leave you with, this is the banner image from APUC's Facebook page. It's a subversive parody of Western high art. It's painted on that symbol of the apartheid, a symbol of apartheid, the separation wall, and photographed and distributed by the artist who is Palestinian, Sliman Mansour. It's really good, I think. So maybe cultural boycott is an awkward and clumsy term difficult to justify in some circumstances, but Palestinians need us to promote the ideas behind the boycott tactic, showing that we are firmly on the side of culture and art, but against the state's exploitation of either. Thanks very much. For artists from Palestine and L as well. Uh, yeah, before before we go into a short break, one or two questions maybe. <coughs> I know there's a few people from the art scene here as well. well I have I have uh, uh, kind of question. No, question. Now you uh, you ask artists to engage with uh, the Palestinian case, mm. but uh, I know a lot of artists uh, who want to make art and uh, who do not want to uh, be engaged, maybe even when they are uh, 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 well, engaged with it, but do not want to be openly uh, engaged, because they also think, I'm an artist and I don't want my work to be seen in a certain perspective. I mean, uh, I uh, produced and directed uh, uh, a performance uh, with four Palestinian uh, actors from Ramallah. Uh, two weeks ago, we, it was uh, staged here. Um, but if you ask me to stand behind the uh, uh, politically behind the political uh, the, the Palestinian case, uh, I'm a bit yeah redundant. Of, uh, I said redundant. Yeah. Yeah. Although I'm completely behind the Palestinian case, but do I want to speak uh, out openly? No, because then my work is seen in a certain perspective. Let the people, let the audience see the performance and decide on the performance and not on my personal opinion. So that's, that's a difficulty uh, I imagine a lot of artists have. How, how do you see that? 
Well, that, I mean, that is a really, really interesting question, and it's one I hope other people will address when we have a broader discussion later. But I think, in fact, what you're doing is what I asked towards the end of my talk for people to do, which was to actively engage in a creative way. So, you know, you are being a very positive force in this whole, whole discussion. I mean, whether you would want to... We'll have to talk about it maybe later, but does that mean what you, does what you said mean that you would not want your name to appear on a petition, for example? Does it mean that you wouldn't want to publicly sign that pledge? I, I don't want to put you on the spot at all, it's just uh, a question. Uh, 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 a petition? I mean, I will sign a petition. Yeah. Uh, but, for example, in an interview in the paper, uh, I would not uh, 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 state as an artist, or as a director in this case, that I support the Palestinian uh, case. Because then I, I, I think the audience should, should see it and then they kind of know what, what, what I think. But um, a, a petition is something personal, because I have my personal opinion, but I don't want that people look at what I make with my opinion in their heads already. I want to discover it when they see in this case, the performance or the artwork, etc. Um, yeah. yeah, I think that that's very interesting. Something supposed to be this is a corollary of the situation of Palestinian artists who don't want to be expected to do work that is only about blood and oppression and wars. And, I mean, an artist is an artist is an artist, and being a Palestinian artist doesn't bar you from expressing yourself about a whole range of human experience, does it? So, I mean, interesting questions. I, I don't have. Uh, answer to that. It's, That's very good. it's going to be—it's certainly going to be one of the questions for the final yeah. panel because I was yeah. thinking about asking that to Sami already. You're touching upon it now. How should we learn from your experience um, in getting artists here to endorse the boycott, even if you have valid? Uh, doubts about what you express through your work and what you express uh, as a as a person in public. These these are questions you run into regularly, I'm sure. I would want to learn more about that at the end.